Good afternoon, Arun. Good afternoon, Rene. Hi, Rashi. Good afternoon. I think all of us are muted. No, 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 I'm not muted. I can hear oh. you. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. So we could hear everything. <laughs> All well, Rene? Yes, I think so. Yes, busy as usual, but I mean, part of life, isn't it? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Keeping busy is something which is uh, a routine for you. Yeah. Ah, yeah, and and equally for you, isn't it? Really? <laughs> yeah, for all of us. That's. Uh... Let me see. Yes. Okay. I can share. Everybody can share. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Arun, when do we start? No. Yeah, we are, we are waiting for Mr. Mark to join. Yeah, yeah. maybe a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Rene, you're back in India or still in Vienna? No, no. I'm back, I'm back in uh, I'm back in Delhi. I was earlier this week in Hyderabad, so I was almost next door. Oh, we missed you. Oh, oh, yes, oh. yes, yes. Uh, time was a bit short, otherwise I would have maybe popped in, but next time sure sure yeah 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 so things have become normal started traveling all along yeah i think it's i think things have to become too normal already isn't it <laughs> and this, this buck is still not away yeah 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 absolutely uh, yeah yeah but uh, but things are uh opening up and more relaxed yes Sir, uh, Giri, sir, we can start. I think we can start. Uh, maybe we can start. Yeah, yeah, we can start. Sure. Then. Okay. Then, uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure and privilege uh, uh, to be here along with you and uh, present you uh, this technical session 5B session uh, is titled "Enabling Net Zero Through the uh, uh, Through the Circular Economy." Uh, we have. Uh, three very uh, very uh, interesting and uh, unique presentations i mean in general if some concept has to be successful you need a good model and uh, then you need some good case studies which demonstrate the the proof of the concept and then uh, demonstrate the advantages of, uh, of this concept and thirdly you need a consultant or you need a, a guide who can take you along and help you in uh, implementing it we have all three in this uh, in this session we have a thought leader in in uh, Rene. Rene is the Unido representative, regional office India Unido. A thought leader who has excellent uh, uh, understanding not only of the the big picture but also the finer technical aspects of uh, anything related to related to sustainability. We have had the privilege of working very closely with Unido and uh, Rene for uh, quite some time, and we have always been uh, impressed and uh, learnt a lot whenever uh, we interacted or listened to Rene in the past. Uh, thank you, thank you, Rene, for uh, being with us here today. And Rene will be presenting his thoughts on uh, the building blocks of uh, circular economy. That will be the uh, the big picture, macro level, uh, with of course a uh, lot of uh, finer details on uh, what uh, what can work and what will be the model for a circular economy. Having said that, we have a model, but we would know how it works, or does it work, or does it really work? We have. Uh, uh, a unique uh, presentation from uh, Ms. Rashi Agarwal, Director Banyan Nation. And you know, we have been working with uh, 
uh, startups, clean tech startups for some time. And whenever uh, the discussion of a clean tech startup comes, one of the, uh, the, the bright examples which CIGBC talks about is uh, Banyan Nation. Uh, thank you, Rashi. Thank you for uh, being here with us. Uh, it's a, a case studies are extremely important and case studies which demonstrate technical and financial feasibility of uh, the circular economy. Uh, a very, very unique and successful startup. They say out of 100 startups, uh, only about 4 to 5 percent are in the clean tech area and uh, still a smaller portion of them are, are successful. And uh, we have the privilege of uh, a, a successful uh, a model which can also get uh, substantially scaled up being present here to uh, uh, speak to you all. And thirdly, of course, uh, uh, you need uh, uh, a consultant to support you, to guide you. We would be having the privilege of Mr. Mark Binder, Global Vice President Consulting of SPERA. Uh, uh, Mark has been working in Daimler Chrysler and uh, PE International for quite some time. And uh, the company is uh, working on uh, 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 analytics with, re with regard to uh, clean tech, uh, with regard to net zero, and, and also has been involved in a lot of consulting. Mark Binder will be sharing his views on uh, is net zero the ultimate or will uh, net zero be sufficient? That's his uh, presentation. Uh, without much further ado, I leave the uh, the this space to the to the experts may now request uh, uh, Rene to make his presentation, please. Over to you, Rene. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Gia, for this uh, this uh, kind introduction, and uh, let me try to share my content. Uh, does it work? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Then I I'll try. Yes, you see the full screen. Yes, yeah. so thank you very much, Gary, and I, I, I take this uh, opportunity to to uh, really talk a bit about uh, the kind of circular economy. But I, I have a specific take, and that we should not surprise you on uh, looking at what manufacturing can do in the circular economy. And that's of course a reflection of uh, of the the role of UNIDO, UNIDO as the in, in United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Our mandate is linked to uh, this SDG Sustainable Development Goal Nine, which talks about inclusive and sustainable industrial development. So that is basically looking for shared prosperity, uh, environmental sustainability and economic development, or I sometimes say as a, a shorthand is factories fit for the future because they are uh, competitive, uh, productive, have a high quality product. They observe uh, environmental standards and try to excel those environmental standards and then also uh, create decent conditions of work for, uh, for, the, um, for employees and also for the community. And under that, under that broader agenda, I guess there are a, a number of uh, of other themes which you might see and then circular and low carbon economy is certainly there, there innovation digitalization economic recovery but also trade and value chains topics on which we work and for those who have been monitoring a little bit of unido and over the past 18 months or so since the COVID times i must say uh, we've been pushing very hard for uh, what we call them business building back business from crisis so looking this at this uh, productivity approach and saying that we are in a crisis but how can we build back a better build back better in the MSME segment. And uh, the other initiative that we have taken is this uh, Swatch Ujok, uh, which is basically saying uh, clean out factory. So remove all the inefficiencies and the ineffectiveness and also start to, to become smarter in the way on more mature in how you operate manufacturing systems. Uh, so that may be as a, as a, as a short uh, uh, comment uh, to start. Uh, and then I, I would like to, to uh, maybe uh, take a little, a couple of minutes to talk about this uh, report, which uh, maybe some of you have seen, but uh, uh, it's basically the UNEP report, the, the first uh, assessment done by UNEP earlier this year, looking at uh, all the, the environmental assessments by the theme areas and bringing this together. And it's called uh, Making Peace with Nature and a scientific framework for uh, to tackle the uh, the climate biodiversity and pollution crises so they really talk about this concept of a triple planetary crisis so climate change biodiversity loss and pollution add up to uh, what is basically our three self-inflicted planetary crises that are closely interconnected and put the well-being of current and future generations at unacceptable risk. So here in the, on the right hand side, I will not go into very much detail, but you, you can see that uh, climate change is linked to biodiversity loss. Biodiversity loss also adds to climate change. And then we have also the land use changes and pollution, which has the impact on there. And uh, I already uh, mentioned also this morning in the, in the, in the, the plenary session that uh, uh, even if we look at just air 
pollution, the, the number of deaths from air pollution have been twice as high as the number of deaths caused by COVID in this period. So we are certainly looking at the quite significant impacts around the categories of pollution, biodiversity loss and climate change. And then uh, I think that, uh, that also the other main observation is that a more piecemeal and uncoordination action on this three aspect falls far short of, uh, of what is needed to prevent environmental decline. Eh? In the climate change area, the, uh, the latest IPCC report uh, says that we're already at 1.09 degree warming, uh, which is, uh, I think, 72 or 73 percent of uh, 1.5 degree, which we have available. Uh, we can say that climate change, uh, you, you probably also heard the um, uh, with the Nobel Prize for Physics was basically discovered in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. So we've already used up 50 years to finally get our act together. And now we have 25 years left to basically fix that the problem. Uh, so that is uh, that, that's uh, the, the triple planetary crisis. And then uh, if you look a little bit further in this diagram, sorry, it's a bit may, maybe small, but I want to, to highlight that this uh, report of making a peace with nature that says we have basically have at the bottom the natural resource base uh, that feeds into production and consumption systems and that should then ultimately be, uh, bring the well-being of people and we can uh, plot our 17 sustainable development goals along those lines. But I, I think what is, what is key to this is the centrality of the production and consumption systems and then we need to have change so the interconnected nature of climate uh, change loss of biodiversity land degradation air and water pollution means that it must be addressed together to maximize the benefits and minimize and also trade off so we need to find solutions that work in all the three uh, main directions and that's quite possible ambitious and coordination action by government business and people can prevent and reverse the worst impacts uh, by rapidly transforming key systems, uh, in particularly energy, water, food and transportation uh, and, and for the use of land and oceans uh, to become then ultimately sustainable. So there is, it's, it's not just a doom and gloom story and say, well, let's forget about it. Let's celebrate the 25 years left. But it is really that if we if we uh, if I may use that uh, term, pull up our socks, we we can still make this happen. And that's the positive spin that we, we should have. And I think it's very much embedded also in the green work movement and then also ultimately that this then this is not only a technical transformation but there's also a social economic systems have to be transformed to, to improve the relationship with nature understanding nature's value and putting value of the of, of nature at the heart of decision making so respecting that ultimately our production and consumption system cannot operate without the natural resource basis uh, so if it then goes a little bit further, and I had, don't have time to elaborate on everything, but basically they say then there's the sort of levers for transformative change. So what are the, the value social cons constructs that we maybe need to change that we should address? And I think, first of all, it comes there like the paradigms and visions for good life. We should have a, a, a less materialistic perception of, uh, of, of what is what is well-being. So well-being is not measured in the number of cars I have, but in, in uh, and how well I feel about this. Uh, and that links that a bit to to being aware about uh, the issues of consumption and waste and population. And there's a lot of talk about the responsibility. So we can say, well, let, let somebody else sort the problem. But ultimately, it is a, a social responsibility, which, which includes that, that you are responsible for making profit, but you're also responsible for the environmental impacts and social impacts of your business. And the issue of inequalities, the, the haves and have nots, I don't have to elaborate much of that. They, they talk a lot about uh, participation in, in the governance of uh, natural resources and, and environmental action so so that really the beneficiaries and the, the, the coastal communities for example take a role in marine litter prevention and, and environmental issues uh, i think a lot of emphasis on the, on the on the externalities in terms of accounting and then on technology innovation and investment i think that is the green co uh, approach and then a lot of no, uh, emphasis on education and knowledge generation and sharing so better collaboration between uh, uh, academia businesses uh, government and see uh, uh, Civil, civil society organizations. And then I already mentioned a bit, there are basically six systems which are highlighted as, as being uh, key to, to change. So that's econo economy and finance, which is more the, the, the flows of capital and investment and food, food and water, energy and human settlements. Human settlements includes and also the transport in that. And then so that's more, more the hardcore economic sectors, the human health, equity and peace is then the, uh, uh, the more the social sectors and environment that, that is meant to be environmental restoration that needs to take place. So uh, addressing the land degradation by diversity losses. 
But basically, if we don't talk about this transformative change of production and consumption systems, one might say that is really what, what we are talking about is a circular economy. So I think that uh, circular and, uh, and, and as if I take a little bit of an outsider, even being indulged in India quite uh, intensively, I think that, that, that many are still seeing circular as equal uh, recycling. So it's basically a new word for the three R, reduce, reuse and recycle. Or we have seen the six R's to add, re rethink, refuse and repair. Or we even see the 12 R's where refurbish, remanufacture, repurpose, redesign, reskill and reverse logistics are added. But I guess that the whole circular economy is not a matter of how many R's can be invented and add together, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's really trying to fix the material flows. And I, I think one could be provocative and say that if we have really a circular economy, we don't have to recycle anymore because everything is repurposed before it becomes waste that needs to be recycled. So the, really the issue is that circular is definitely not recycling. And that is uh, something that we, we need to, to embrace uh, probably. Uh, from UNIDO perspective, uh, there has been some uh, uh, some e efforts on this, and 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 I, th I think that the key point that UNIDO has been making, and I think is very valid, that that if whatever circular we want, we, we still need gadgets or goods and services which are manufactured. So it needs to be also an industrial economy that returns products, parts, and materials into use several times along value plane change. Uh, so basically designing products that last value is maintained for as long as possible and waste and pollution is minimized and renewables are used as much as possible. And you could uh, basically also uh, illustrate it in this way. So if you see at the bottom line is more the linear uh, material supply, design, manufacture, distribution and use and an end of first life. And then you have the basically the different uh, circular economy practices. I think that uh, there, there, it, it, is, it is really uh, important that we recognize that circular economy means many different things to different people. And that, that is also, uh, 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 I would say, hampering progress on, on actually moving forward because it becomes a competition of my understanding of circular economy is better than yours and that, that is unproductive. I think that it's more productive to see a comprehensive framework and then accept that not everybody can move all the parts of the machinery. So uh, you, you turn this cock wheel and somebody else still turns another cockwheel basically to get things uh, uh, moving. Uh, so in that sense, I, I put here some kind of a, what is what has been done by the European Environmental Agency and some of our own work also in there, a kind of what could we see as a taxonomy for circular economy? Uh, because I think what is key and people are saying is that it's about innovations and that we need different products, materials and technologies. And we need different business models and we need different consumption patterns and lifestyles. So that is the, the key element. And so some are, uh, if I take the work of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, for example, focuses a lot on the business models. I think uh, the MacArthur Foundation is, is probably more on the consumption patterns and lifestyle changes, but ultimately all of those are necessary. They can be applied in all the life cycle stages. So whether it's materials or design, product design, uh, production and distribution, use or end of life. So we have, have different perspectives. And probably it's also the tools that uh, that's for, for people in the, or, or uh, and enterprise in different life cycle stages, there will be different business case for circular economy. But uh, overarching to this is then probably the uh, circular strategies, uh, which are guiding this. And I, I put them, I will elaborate a little bit more on that circularity, efficiency, and switch. And then we have, of course, some enablers, which are educational behavior and public policy and markets. Uh, and markets, of course, are guided by public policy and educational behavior and change. So there's many interlinkages. So we can see this all, uh, all together. So, but I, I guess it, it helps to say that uh, it's not just about uh, uh, leasing models or, or extended use models. It's also about physical changes that have to take place. Um, I put there uh, then, uh, and maybe some have, have seen this before, but the kind of the circular industry uh, strategies. And I, I, we, we put them a, a little bit provocative as, uh, as uh, first of all, go renewable. So maximize substitution of non-renewable resources. So you could say that's a resource shift. So try to, because with uh, uh, renewable materials, there is a principle, the opportunity to recycle back into nature because uh, biodegradable materials can go back into nature. Of course, there's many boundary conditions, but the fundamental issue is that with renewable materials can be closed. We have an opportunity for two cycles, either in uh, a cycle in the economic system or a cycle through the ecology system. Then, of course, there is the, the issue that remains valid, that is relentlessly practice efficiency. So the more efficient we are, the less 
waste we have, so the easier it becomes to close the cycle. So improve the efficiency of use of all resources. And then lastly is the recycle. And I add there perpetually, because I think that value recovery means that we not only find a solution for the next, for to get rid of waste, to, so to speak, uh, provocatively, but that we also see that uh, once we have used plastics in a second application, what will be the third, the fourth, the fifth application? So we need to think in, the, in continuous cycles in that sense. So if I give just some examples, and some of these are examples that you need to work, some is other work, but uh, uh, I think that with the resource shift, I, I, I sometimes take it a bit uh, philosophically, and I think we need to look at what is provided by nature, and I would put it as, as a, a, a two sides. So it could be resourced from nature, so what we take out of nature, and just to give you an example of, of some materials which are there, uh, so look at alternative renewable materials, and there's a lot, a lot is going on alternative type, textile fibers, bamboo, banana leaves, uh, uh, pineapple leaves, and other, other stuff which could be an alternative to growing cotton, which is highly energy and chemical intensive and water intensive. I think the other could be also on the energy side, and I just uh, put, because you need to put some effort in that into the solar thermal area, uh, where we could say this is, uh, this is at a uh, Actually, at a pharma company in, in Puducherry, where we installed this uh, solar collectors to basically produce just hot water, which they need in the pharma process. And that's another option uh, in addition to the PV or the, uh, the biofuels options that we have. But I think if we can expand this, uh, this provided by nature, we can also look at the solutions which are in nature and try to replicate the solutions from nature. So I would call that maybe inspired by nature. And I, th I just do look at two examples which are there. And I think the, there's many works are now on the, on the issue of uh, industrial applications of enzymes. And enzymes are biocatalysts. So you can do re chemical reactions with much more specificity, not using large amounts of, uh, uh, of solvents, and also at the more at the room or near room temperatures. So there's uh, many opportunities for, for resource efficiency changes by, by doing this. It's not necessarily exactly extracted from nature, but it's inspired by nature. And the second example that I, I give there is this, this all these developments about uh, uh, using the mixing uh, principles which are there in nature, which are very efficient because of rough, uh, different surface uh, uh, conditions and so on. And that can be replicated in industrial reactors, uh, this whole issue of flow chemistry, con continuous reactors, which can replace huge equipments, which are batch reactors, which run for many times. And this, uh, this kind of devices, you can produce the same as in a one ton of chemical fast vessel. Uh, and this is some of the areas which, uh, um, Giri, you also are aware of, which we try to do with the facility for low carbon technology deployment, which is Jeff project, which we do also amongst others with BEE and with uh, CII. So many opportunities there, I think, as, as, a, um, as, a, as an innovator, as a person who likes innovation, this is really very interesting uh, work. Uh, then I go to uh, resource efficiency, and I think the, there has been quite a lot of emphasis in the international community through the International Resources Panel on the importance of material efficiency. And material efficiency then being important uh, basically because uh, the, the, uh, there has been between 1995 and 2015, so in 20 years' time, there has been a 2.3-fold increase in GHG emissions, which are directly related to materials production, particularly uh, uh, metals, cement, and plaster, plastic. And rubber and wood production. So this is a, a huge, uh, a huge share of uh, it's it's almost a quarter of the global GHG emissions are just linked to making stuff which which we makes cars, homes, uh, machines, airplanes, and other uh, and other. Uh, uh, manufactured goods. And if you look a little bit further, then you could look at it from a, from a climate perspective or zero perspective. This, it is a material cycle emission, so that's the emissions from cement plants or steel factories. But it's also material efficiency that reduces the, these material cycle emissions because we use less steel or less concrete. But it also reduces then the operational energy use. Uh, so if we design a lighter car, we have less fuel uh, use in the life cycle. So we have also this operational energy use adding to life cycle emission reductions. And then the resources panel went a bit further and did some as estimates by 2050, what could be achieved. And they looked at material efficiency uh, homes, and I will not go into all the details, but they, the expectation, they, the estimates from the models which have been run is that with known material efficiency strategies, life cycle emissions could be reduced by 35% uh, in the G7 countries. And in China and India, it could even be larger. Up to 60% of life cycle emissions could be avoided by really practicing what we already know 
in terms of material efficiency strategies in homes. And that relates to building stronger homes, better designed, better construction practices, so that we can use the same homes for a longer period of time and that they are designed to not to be a heat accumulator, but keep heat out. And I think here this is also very much linked to the work that CII is doing on the green buildings and, and related areas. The second case study was on material efficient cars. I think it's, it's, it's near more or less a similar story. So it's about 40% life cycle emissions that can be reduced uh, in the in the G7 countries. China and India is a little bit less, and that's largely a result of the difference in fleet. So Indian fleet tends to be lighter and smaller than the uh, the international fleet of the look at the US or so. So there's a huge potential for material efficiency to add to uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction. So you, you could say maybe a quarter or a third of the emission targets could be easily achieve this material efficiency strategies that we already know. Uh, and then, of course, uh, this this is at the macro level. At the micro level, we have then this concept of resource efficient and cleaner production. So we say we first want to improve the efficiency of use of materials, energy, and water. And then we have basically have less stuff to throw away. So we minimize the generation of waste, effluents, and emissions. And then that improves also occupation and community health and well-being. And that improves then this uh, productivity. And I think that's this notion of a of a virtuous self-nurturing or self-reinforcing uh, cycle is maybe not not yet that well understood. But it's very clear if you go at a manufacturing level that this is the case. So if you have a better organized workplace, less waste, people are more motivated. They won't they won't run from day one to uh, to look for another job. They will stay with you. You have uh, all the training benefits. They will have less absenteeism and so on. So that many many benefits are there even beyond the, 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 the just the energy savings or the water savings. Uh, and then we we do, do this with the resource efficiency clean production network. So we say basically say increase resource productivity. So uh, unit of product per kilogram of material used per kiloliter of water or per uh, kilo megawatt of energy used, and decreasing then pollution intensity. So kilogram of waste or kilogram of effluent or CO2 emissions per unit of production. Not much time to go into detail, but I think this is well known and it's also practices which are at the core of green code. So you look at to getting your house in order, using the right inputs, controls in there, making sure that everything runs efficiently, having the right technology, looking at heat recovery, materials recovery, water recovery, and see what, what somebody can use outside and what is what is opportunities for eco-design of products. Uh, so then uh, this can be extended and that gets me to the third uh, strategy of resource circularity and we can basically look at this resource efficient and clear production at the enterprise level. We can combine it with two years, I could say. Uh, we can look at the energy of water systems that support multiple enterprise. So we can optimize the water energy use and we use to encompass in the industrial park. So somebody needs high grade water, somebody else uses a lower grade water, so can perhaps just take the waste water from the other one. And the same is uh, waste heat and you see the concepts now coming up of steam highways in, in industrial parks or integrated water systems, which are providing uh, many opportunities. And in the more traditional way, industrial symbiosis could then also look at what waste materials can be utilized in the steel making and uh, cement making or in other industries. So they're using the one company waste into another factory as the industrial symbiosis. And we could also look at the uh, plastics waste from cities going into uh, steel making or steel in other products. And this can be extended with <clears throat> in, in the industrial symbiosis into an eco-industrial park. And which is also now uh, what uh, what earlier the DPIIT uh, 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 announced earlier this week with the industrial park rating scheme. Some elements of this eco industrial park are now also promoted through uh, Invest India and uh, and other agencies. But I want to uh, highlight uh, maybe uh, uh, before I then conclude, because before you get nervous on watching on your watch, Geary, uh, to look at the uh, uh, kind of the remanufacturing as an opportunity. And I think the remanufacturing, I, of course, if I can look at the website, the, the, the definitions, and it says to manufacture into a new product. But there has been a lot of uh, remanufacturing happening in, in India, perhaps, which has not been up to the standards. And that's why there has now been uh, more definitions. And they, they, they really focus on that remanufacturing is, is bringing it back to like new or better than new conditions. So we don't want remanufacturing to be worse than than, uh, than fresh manufacturing, virgin manufacturing. And this is actually, I, I, it was already the case in the, in the in, in 
maybe 15 years ago in Europe that that some of the companies were putting in uh, refurbished uh, gearboxes in the in major trucks and nobody would know actually that it was refurbished it was just done and it, the same performance guarantees would be given so we need to think of remanufacturing as a as a, as as bringing back to 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 new or better than new uh, so this was done by American standards institution so so in the, the work of the um, uh, international resource panel they have kind of put it then in value retention process so they try to uh, I, see, I think split it even a bit a bit uh, further and say what is the difference between refurbishment and remanufacturing and so on I think this is this becomes uh, might become a bit academic on what is refurbishing what's remanufacturing uh, but I think they looked at, uh, at what is the potential and they looked at vehicle parts heavy duty equipment parts and industrial digital printers as examples of uh, of, uh, um, of machinery for which uh, remanufacturing might be useful and they found that that uh, uh, GHD emissions from doing this are in the range of 79 to 99%. Material conservation is a bit different on what practices, but in the range of 80 to 100%. And then the cost savings, they were estimated at 15 to 80%. But of course, that is a, a bit dependent on, uh, on, on, on how, uh, uh, what kind of products, what is the reverse logistics that are involved. But it's, it's clearly that if we want to remanufacture, we have to have also the innovative business model so that we get the, the a, a, a worn out product back rather than a wasted product uh, that can indeed be remanufactured. So we need innovative business models, uh, product service systems or product as, as a service. And we need to then also, if you know that you will get it back to remanufacture, you might use different materials. So you would drive the remanufacturing business by new product designs and priorities. So it's more durable, upgradable, able to be refurbished or remanufactured. So it brings a lot of emphasis. It's not remanufacturing has a feedback loop to how we design products in the first place. Um, I think that we did uh, earlier this year uh, a, a, few, a few interventions on the remanufacturing. And I think that what is clear is that it's, it's an established sector that has largely operated in the limelight. It's happening at a larger scale that customers are aware of. So, so the Tatas are certainly doing several thousands of uh, truck engines a, a month. Uh, in terms of re, uh, uh, of refurbishment uh, of remanufacturing, we see a lot of printer cartridges being remanufactured, but several of those are certainly not of the right quality. Uh, but it, and that is uh, adding to the second point that they are suffering from a negative legacy that uh, that uh, uh, remanufacturers should always be worse, and that is that is really not uh, the right way. So we we think that uh, uh, and I, I I made a lens for that. If we have a manufacturing policy, we should also have a remanufacturing policy, or at least a focus on remanufacturing manufacturing in there so that we create a conducive uh, environment and reduce the risks also so I mean uh, some of the manufacturers are saying I can't engage into uh, uh, remanufacturing because of what is my liabilities in there so it's for remanufacture for consumers that we deal also with the uh, reverse logistics and uh, to catalyze and also investment so if, it, if the framework conditions are right people would be happy to, to spend money in terms of uh, catalyzing investments uh, so I will close here. I think that uh, if I, I put it and I put very much uh, every time resource efficiency, circular economy together, and that's also what uh, UNIDO and the EU and uh, UNEP have launched, a global alliance for circular economy and resource efficiency. So it's very much almost like two sides of a complementary sides of the coin. But I think that uh, it can mean many different things to different people, but it must go beyond recycling. Uh, in, and it, it has the element of the circular, it's two words circular, that means physical products and value chains, and it's an economy. So it should ultimately have, a, have cash flows and revenue flows that drive and uh, perpetuate the system. It's designed in and provides for a new lens for business and, for, and product and process innovation. And I think it's achievable, and I would call the quote unquote industrialization of resource switch, resource efficiency, and circularity. And with industrialization, I mean that this is about quality, replicability, uh, good labor conditions, uh, decent conditions of, of employment. So you create this, uh, this industry around this, uh, uh, this resource switch, resource efficiency, and circularity. Uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to discuss these points further on. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Rene. You are packed so much into uh, such a such a short presentation. I, I assure all the delegates who are listening to this, if you have not been able to grasp all the points which Rene had brought out in his presentation, the presentation will be available. The videos will be made available to all of us. So if we can go through the presentation once again to get a, a grasp of all the points which uh, uh, Renee spoke about.
I particularly liked on uh, your uh, exploration of circular economy in terms of circular industrial economy, in terms of circular strategies, innovation, life cycle stages, and enablers. I think that brought out uh, every aspect of uh, circular economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rene. I think uh, we will have a lot of questions for you at the end of uh, already a few of them have already come in. Now, without much further ado, may I request uh, uh, Rashi to go ahead with her presentation, please. Rashi? Yes, sure. Let me just share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, please. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, great. So, um, thank you again for inviting us to speak. Uh, you know, uh, definitely Rene laid out uh, very good models. Uh, for a circular economy, um, it's a vast field and we're just one very small piece of the whole, whole uh, ecosystem. Uh, so I'll try to sum up my our journey as a company very quickly. Um, just to start, uh, here's what we do. Uh, we are a, a circular economy recycling company and uh, our aim is to uh, replace the use of virgin plastic in over 500 million packaging bottles by next year. And we, we want to do this through partnership with the informal sector uh, that, uh, you know, uh, controls the chain of uh, supplies for, uh, the, you know, uh, recyclable plastics in India, as well as in partnership with major brands uh, like Unilever and Reckitt that have uh, committed to use, uh, you know, uh, recycled plastics in their packaging. Um, so just before I get into the story of how we got here and who enables our work, um, I wanted to share four key milestones uh, from the last 15 months that really excite me and the company. Um, so in June, 2020, we, uh, helped you several brands, uh, categories uh, of brands within Unilever uh, launch bottles with 25% recycled plastics, uh, you know, all made by Banyan. And this was done for the first time in India. Um, in 2020 October, we helped Dettol meet India's first 100% recycled uh, bottle by a major uh, FNCG brand. And by August 2021, we had already hit 150 million HDP bottles made from our uh, premium recycled plastics. And just last month, uh, Surfixel announced that they've moved their entire uh, packaging for Surfixel brand to 50% recycled plastics uh, going forward. And this is three years ahead of their global commitments uh, for this brand. So uh, we're just happy that we could enable this acceleration uh, within the uh, global uh, scenario. So before, uh, you know, I tell you the story of how Banyan did it, uh, you know, all the leaders in my company tell our story differently, but I just want to tell you the story of how everyday people affect recycling in India, right? Uh, so I'll start with my own household. This is my daughter's Vanny. And uh, she, you know, at the end of the day, when she leaves for home, she collects all the, uh, you know, bottles from our household and puts them in one bag. And every week she'll take that bag, um, you know, for and sell all those recyclable bottles for uh, some extra cash that she spends on her grandchildren. Uh, she sells it to someone like Bittu, uh, who we've met, and he is, um, you know, uh, he, his father never finished 10th grade, but Bittu is the first one in his family to have gone to college thanks to the uh, thriving recycling business, uh, the street corner recycling business that they have. Bittu then segregates the bottles uh, and sells them to someone like Abid. Um, Abid has a ware ware warehouse and uh, his warehouse definitely has grown in the year. Uh, he was with the help of the, uh, you know, the uh, POs that were able to give him and the contracts and the options. He was able to get mudra loans uh, to purchase a bailing press and expand his uh, processing capacity further. 
Um, there are several women who work at Abid's uh, warehouse. Uh, obviously, when the COVID crisis hit, a lot of these women who, you know, sometimes are the sole breadwinners for their families were temporarily unemployed. But commitments from our customers, um, you know, helped us keep our commitments and we helped them gain their livelihood. We segregated and the bills. Uh, our team, Hanu, Yadaya, all these guys inspect the, uh, you know, the bills. They, uh, the money is instantly transferred into Abid's bank account. The, uh, the the bales are loaded onto a frozes truck. A frozes has been here pretty much since uh, Banyan started. Uh, he was uh, he had just put uh, you know start uh, he just was leasing a truck at the time. Today, uh, a froze owns uh, two Tata Ace trucks that he's been able to finance through the regular uh, business that we provide to him. And a froze brings it back to the Banyan factory where people waiting and eager to make sure we uh, you know ensure the highest quality uh, recycling at the factory we have employees from states who were obviously all uh, unemployed uh, during the uh, who uh, you know stayed employed during the uh, covid crisis who could have been unemployed who stayed uh, employed because the team took uh, some pay cuts to make sure all our employees uh, were able to retain and that they stay with us. And since then, they've been, you know, tirelessly working to deliver on customer orders. And using this plastic, uh, various brands across the country, various bottle makers across the country use 25 to 50% recycled plastics for the first time ever in India. And this new raw material was able to seamlessly integrate into the customer's uh, supply chains. And bottled product uh, was handled by several people in retailer supply. And this was the first time when uh, post-consumer recycled plastics were used in packaging uh, by mainstream products at large scale. So the reason why I thought it's important to tell you the story of recycling is when we talk about, you know, resource conservancy, we often forget about the people that make it happen. And uh, I think I want to make it my life's mission to make sure that we highlight the all important work that a lot of the people in our country do uh, in this uh, in this arena. So getting to the real serious story behind Banyan, you know, b before we came in, uh, what was really stopping brands uh, from using plastics in their supply chains? Uh, there were, you know, three main problems. Uh, there was the complex layers uh, that form the supply chains for recycled plastics in our country. We have itinerant collectors uh, like my nanny or like our, uh, you know, uh, household helpers or watchmen or security personnel, or it could be rag pickers as well. So these are all itinerant collectors who retrieve the recyclables from our waste streams and then sell them to stationary aggregators who are often called kabadiwalas in our country. Um, they then further segregate the materials and sell them to larger aggregators, segregators uh, like so. And uh, traditionally, these materials went to small scale recyclers like the one you see uh, in this picture, and that's the only part of the chain uh, that we're altering, really. So uh, even though, you know, India recovers 70% of its waste plastic, a lot of it is, uh, you know, unscientifically segregated or downcycled. Um, you know, to any polymer experts out there, there are injection molded, blow molded, and extrusion molded articles all put in the same bucket as though they were the same, right? And also, of course, there was, you know, a clear lack of uh, recycling uh, and cleaning technology that would make it possible for mainstream products, where, whether it was auto or FMCG, uh, to use recycled plastics in their packaging. And we changed this through dual innovations. Uh, basically, we uh, devised a software platform that helped us integrate uh, the informal sector that we work with today and on the other hand, we develop a 
you know, pl uh, plastic cleaning technology that could at volume produce, uh, you know, reliable qualities uh, of, uh, uh, you know, recycled polymer. Today we have um, a facility, a world-class facility in Hyderabad, if I may add, um, you know, it's basically, uh, ha it has a capacity of 6,000 tons per annum today. Where, uh, you know, given the success that we've seen, we will, we're expanding it to 12,000 tons per annum by next year already. Uh, we have um, the capacity to do uh, all polyolefins at the plant. Uh, we also have invested heavily in a water recycling system. Uh, those, you know, uh, those of you who know how recycling works, uh, I'm sure you know that it's a very water intensive process. And what we've done is we've invested in a closed loop water uh, recovery and recycling system that helps ensure that we use that resource as efficiently as possible. Um, and because of all these uh, innovations, uh, you know, we're able to produce a high quality polymer that is REACH and CONIC uh, or, you know, heavy metals compliant. Uh, we also have uh, various ISO certifications and are, um, you know, ethical sourcing uh, certified as well. Um, so Banyan's technology, uh, you know, removes over 90% uh, of, uh, you know, con uh, contaminants such as, uh, um, you know, oil, shampoos, lotions, then we have, uh, you know, labels, adhesives, inks uh, that that are all a part of uh, packaging today. And uh, basically, we remove all of these contaminations to produce very clean flakes. Uh, these clean flakes um, are then dried uh, to remove moisture. They are uh, then color sorted. And if needed, we also have a resin sorter that resin sorts them. Um, and then uh, basically, uh, we use, uh, you know, the best in class extrusion technology in the world is something we bought off the shelf from Austria. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, you know, reviewed to be the best uh, extrusion technology in the world, which takes care of any and all contaminants that may have been left behind by our uh, cleaning technology. It's a, uh, you know, vented extruder, so it removes all volatiles as well. Uh, from uh, from plastics, and uh, it's also one of the most energy efficient uh, systems uh, to granulate plastics uh, uh, in the world. And what we get at the other end are very, uh, you know, uh, clean granules that can be used in various uh, applications. We've had most success with, um, you know, uh, using it in packaging. You see the iconic bottles, uh, the, the toilet cleaner bottles, in that photo, um, you know, we've had a lot of success with using it in all FMCG product packaging, but we're also expanding to both other products as well as other, uh, you know, packaging opportunities um, as well. So um, as I end the presentation, uh, you know, I just want to leave um, a thought behind as to what citizens and corporations can do uh, to participate in the plastics economy. Um, I think um, first is we can, you know, support uh, responsible uh, production and responsible uh, packaging by asking questions like, is this recyclable? And if it is recycled, it, is it being recycled? And is it made from uh, recycled plastic? So favoring more, uh, uh, you know, recyclable, recycled and, uh, uh, you know, renewable plastics, as we call it. And then the biggest question that I think a lot of us do not ask it is, pack, is the packaging, actually, is it appropriate, right? Uh, we see big e-commerce boxes come with very little uh, product that is packaging, that is packaged inside them with a whole bunch of packaging around it. Uh, so we should really question such practices by uh, companies and give them active feedback about making their packaging more appro appropriate. Uh, I think also we should invest as citizens and corporations uh, some time to learn more about plastics. I think, uh, uh, you know, not many people uh, know what the number, the recycling numbers, at the bottom, um, what they do with those numbers, uh, how those numbers are supposed to help. Uh, so I think we, if the more time we spend in educating ourselves about plastics, uh, especially do, uh, to curb the problem. And I think um, as uh, 
relevant to India because, uh, you know, we have a huge number of people that rely on recycling for their livelihoods. Uh, we should enable, I think, the, uh, the champions of um, such uh, services in our communities. So whether they're the local recyclers, the uh, collectors, segregators, aggregators, uh, just help them, support them um, to, uh, to be better champions of a circular economy uh, in our country. So that, with that, I'll end uh, my presentation. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Rashi. Thank you for that uh, brilliant presentation. You said uh, you are a small component of the overall circular economy, but I would say it's a very important component. And uh, I think you are uh, replacing virgin plastics for 500 million plastic bottles by 2022. I think it's a laudable goal. I'm sure uh, we should be closer to it or going beyond that. And lastly, the, the overall story was very humane. You brought out the uh, recycling, how recycling can have a positive impact on people. That's the, uh, that was one uh, very unique thing which you presented. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are already a few questions. Perhaps uh, as we go along, we will uh, we will have the questions at the end of the presentations. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for uh, joining. It's a privilege to, uh, privilege to have you uh, speaking to us. Uh, may I request you to share your presentation and and share your views on what beyond net zero or will net zero be uh, sufficient enough? Over to you, Mark. Now you are muted, Mark. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, it, it's an honor to be here uh, and to present uh, in this uh, conference. Uh, I apologize for the beginning. I had uh, huge technical problems with my computer. Uh, I hope it is working right now. Now, um, you probably can't see my screen yet, right? Not yet, Mark. No, not yet. Yeah. Screen. You see my screen now? Yes, please. Yes. Yes, please. Oh, attractive. So, uh, thank you uh, for, as I said, hi, I'm Mark. Um, uh, sorry for the little um, challenges we had in the beginning. I hope you still see my screen. Uh, I'm not 100% sure because I don't see the platform. Um, so, as you saw in the little movie, I'm really happy to have you all joining uh, the conference. It's really great to see uh, that we have so many attendees. Um, and I think it's it's really important. Uh, I want to go back a little bit uh, higher level um, and want to talk about uh, will net zero be enough? Um, this is something which is we are working on uh, for a while now. And um, as you can see, there is a, it's it's it feels like everyone wants to combat climate change. Uh, one time is a large number of players joining various initiatives. So we have like science-based targets, um, which is uh, one of the largest initiatives we have like right now. Um, nearly 1,900 companies taking actions, uh, 934 already set quantitative targets, uh, and uh, 846 committed to even to 1.20. Uh, why do I I stretch the um, the climate change? Uh, because this is I think this is one of the largest. Uh, challenge we have right now. Um, and it has effect on a lot of other, uh, other uh, 
players and environmental impacts. And another initiative which we have is the Climate Pledge, which aims towards net zero by 20, 2040, where we have uh, more than 100 signatories already. But these are only two initiatives out of, uh, out of a lot which are going on. And as you can see, there, is a, there are a lot of people talking about uh, combating climate change. And I will come to circular economy and to the life cycle related later. But talking about it, but do we have, uh, do we have enough actions? Um, so uh, I think we all agree that uh, it's a great, that it's an important issue and climate change situation can be tied back to, uh, to really the industrial revolution. Um, before industrial revolution, uh, we didn't see this type of problems and challenges we see today. Um, we have learned a lot since, or haven't we? Uh, even governments have learned a lot, I think, um, uh, where they came together in 1992 uh, in the uh, first summit in Rio, where 145 states signed uh, that we have to do something. Uh, they, they showed their, their commitment. Uh, but, uh, and then we had in 1997, where the famous Kyoto Protocol were, uh, got signed. Uh, but, you know, in, in 1992, uh, the companies, uh, companies came to, uh, and uh, governments came together saying it is an issue, but it took until 2015 uh, at COP21 in Paris to include a target uh, to really say, hey, where do we have to stay in? And we, and we need to stay within the two degrees target with a goal um, to stay within 1.5%. Um, still, there's lots of commitments and talking and aligning, but where is the action? What did we achieve? Uh, great level of awareness. And according to the latest IPCC report, which uh, you probably all know, um, we have increased uh, already uh, one degree uh, with the upper range of probably 1.3 degree. So, um, this is what we achieved. Uh, that's what happened in the past. So this shows us we need to go beyond net zero by 2050 uh, or even better earlier. Uh, because otherwise, if we're not doing this, uh, we all know what's, what's going to happen. Let's take a step back, looking at specific examples, specific uh, areas which impacted human beings with our actions or non-actions. Um, I would like to show you some, uh, go back to the Amazon. This is a really, uh, not only beautiful place, uh, it is also considered uh, part of the lung of the earth. So, um, and we have um, rainforests all around the world and I wanna go show you what happened here. So we as human beings, uh, we cut down trees for wood um, as a resource. We burn trees for farmland. Uh, and due to temperature rises, uh, we had a lot of uh, new number of wildfires, uh, which increased there. So this not only impacts uh, the climate, it also impacts uh, species and biodiversity. Um, so, but who do I tell? Uh, we are sitting here all uh, looking how to improve the environmental burden. So we know that. Uh, so let's move this perspective again. How does it look from a global view? So, hmm. This doesn't really look better. Fires everywhere, significant deforestation uh, as uh, shown by the NASA shot. Uh, just some examples of what's going on right now. Um, millions of hectares burning in the northern part of Russia, while uh, Russia is hit in the south, uh, southern part by water. Um, what we also saw in uh, even in New York, they see effects on uh, wildfires on fires in California because the smoke came over uh, to the uh, to the East Coast. This all speaks for itself. So we really must stop uh, burning down the house. Uh, and one uh, key cornerstone to achieve this is to go beyond net zero. And one uh, one uh, important. Um, action and uh, tool which we out of the toolbox is circular economy um, to really uh, cut down and and uh, and uh, save resources and reuse and be more environmental friendly and 
Uh, but lots of those impacts seem abstract and far away for, for a lot of global players. Um, but lately, uh, what we saw, the climate crisis has arrived in our backyard. Uh, one indication hits our local news. Uh, um, me, I'm sitting here in Germany, so we had like a lot of uh, storms and floodings last July with, uh, with hundreds of deaths, um, where in areas where we did not have that before. And at the same time, a series of floods caused and devastation in the Western Indian state of Maharashtra, where you usually don't have that. So is this something which we just accept? Um, I don't think we should. Uh, it is something uh, from my perspective, uh, which is related to all the uh, climate change, which we which we uh, are currently seeing. So we definitely can say the only people uh, who can deny climate change are the ones who have their eyes closed. Again, uh, who do I tell? I think uh, most of the people who are working on the sustainability and environmental part, they know that. Uh, so let's shift perspective again. What is science telling us? I think with the latest IPCC report, uh, which is science-based uh, without doubt, uh, the uh, human influence has swarmed the atmosphere and ocean land. Uh, that's that's set. Uh, climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in uh, every region across the globe. Uh, it is not uh, set in the uh, in some of the regions. It's now all across the globe, even. Um, even as I said, even we in Germany experienced that. Um, human caused uh, global surface temperature increase as of the, today surpassed uh, the one, one degree already. Uh, let's remember the two at uh, the 1.5 degrees, which we have to stay within in 2050. So we are now at 2021 and we already surpassed one degree. Uh, and human induced uh, global warming. Uh, must reach uh, net zero latest by 2050. So this is something which, if we if we're not working towards that together, uh, it will look totally different. And basically, what science is basically telling us, as mankind, mankind, get your act together. And um, I think we'll go to the next and stop daydreaming about a better future. So uh, we always uh, like to daydream and say, hey, it, um, it is coming and, and everything will be got good. But I think uh, nowadays we all, the governmental and NGOs, academia, industry, and consumers definitely need to pull in the same direction. Um, therefore, I'm happy that we have all those conferences and industry partners and consumers and academia and we're we saw in the beginning uh, governments uh, talking here and sitting together, thinking about how can we tackle that um, that challenge, which is really, uh, really uh, important for us as uh, human beings. And that uh, and we create, um, and what we need to create is, uh, from uh, my perspective, a seven C's mindset. Um, we need to work on clean fuel and energy. Uh, we need to cooperate between countries because it's not working uh, that uh, we have like countries uh, doing that on their own. It's a global challenge which we have in front of us. Uh, we need to collaborate with suppliers. Uh, it needs to go across the whole value chain uh, because otherwise it is not working out. Uh, we need to work on uh, new technology and uh, one technology is carbon capture and sequestration uh, to, uh, to filter out uh, CO2 out of our emissions, that uh, it's not uh, hitting the atmosphere. Um, but and this is this is one key part which we also need to work on. Um, but we really can't afford to screw up uh, this time um, with this, because I just want to go back a little bit. When I was uh, probably 16, 17 years old, we had the first nuclear power plants. Uh, we had those. Um, those movements, uh, people didn't like nuclear power plants because of nuclear waste. Uh, and at that time, everybody told me, uh, hey, once we get the first nuclear waste back, we have a solution. Uh, it's no problem. And then 20 years later, the first nuclear waste came back and uh, we still said, yeah, we're working on the solution. So for me, this 
carbon capture and sequestration is really something which uh, I strongly believe we all need to, to work towards it, support it, uh, because this is a key part of uh, that we're going to get carbon, uh, carbon neutral by 2050, hopefully by 2040. And um, and now I'm coming to circularity. This is not only important regarding carbon. This is also re, uh, important regarding resource consumption. We saw uh, some really great examples on uh, how to work on circular um, approaches um, uh, in the first uh, two speakers uh, talked about it. Uh, and I think this is uh, this is really key. Um, it is really key uh, because we only have a limited number of resources. Uh, and the more resources we take out of the ground, um, we will uh, we will harm our environment even more. So it is really uh, it's a something which we need to integrate in our business practices. Uh, but not only um, doing something good, we also need to communicate uh, and, and build awareness and promote that. And if uh, companies do good things, uh, please all go out and talk about it. Because if you don't talk about it. People don't know it, and then they probably buy the wrong products. So it's it's not like like 10, 15, 20 years ago uh, uh, that people said ah, in the backyard we, we do something green. No, uh, if you do something, go out. Don't be shy. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, we need to work on uh, educating consumer behavior change because uh, who is the, the person who is doing the ultimate has the ultimate uh, influence at the end? It is the consumer. Um, and uh, again, these are lots of initiatives, ideas, and concepts. But uh, what's missing in this piece? Uh, I think um, this is something we'll probably a little bit be surprised, uh, but we need to understand the facts and figures across the whole value chain. Um, for me and for us, uh, I believe um, we have a lot of, um, and we also saw there are software products uh, and um, we need to get the baseline of corporations and our products um, to be able to really do that in an efficient way. And if we don't have this uh, baseline, we don't know uh, how we can how we can improve. And if we have this baseline uh, to be able to do that in an efficient way, um, we need to really work together towards integrated solution models of software, data, and consulting to be efficient. Um, there are a lot of um, environmental people who are doing environmental consultancy out there and saying, hey, but uh, if we have this, then we're going to lose uh, our jobs. It is not like this. Uh, I think we need to be more efficient. We need to be more transparent to make the right decision. Um, and uh, all those great people and all those talent then uh, will work um, with uh, us together to, towards a more uh, greener and, uh, and fighting the combat against climate change. But and guess what? Uh, we do need to go beyond carbon. Even if um, we need to go beyond, beyond environment, we also need to look at social and governance perspectives. And, and uh, this, is, this is, again, a no-brainer um, for, for us and for you, I think. But this is something which we really have to, have to go out uh, and promise. Because uh, if we focus now only on uh, either circularity or on carbon or on one point, no. We need to go beyond that because otherwise we shift burdens to a different, to a different um, challenge which we have to fight. But what is missing in these pictures? Who at the end makes the difference? Um, and I think it's not a surprise. It's the consumer. It's the consumer with its buying decision. The consumer has the ultimate power. Uh, therefore, um, all the great effort, all the approaches we do, Either being recircular, or we being uh, carbon neutral, or we being uh, from an LCA perspective, great. Uh, if we if we don't communicate to the consumer, and if the consumer doesn't know, he may make the wrong decision. So we need to provide transparent information to consumers that they can make the uh, right decision, or we can make the right decision. For example, uh, we have, and this is just one example which I. I like this, the European Foot Environmental Footprinting Initiative, which is ongoing towards a transparent information to consumers. And why do I feel this is so important? Um, do you remember probably, and, and you probably can challenge, uh, 
is this something which consumers uh, will will uh, will adapt? Uh, they will buy do their buying decision on that, uh, and it's challenged by a lot of people. But uh, I would like to make a little bit analogy story about. Um, do you remember way back um, in the early days of the nutrition labels? Um, when they got on the products, who made a decision using those little numbers on the product back then? I think not, not a lot of people. But nowadays, uh, and it's not amazing how powerful are these, these days, um, how, that uh, they're making people making buying decisions on uh, low carb uh, sugar. Um, so these are things which uh, I believe uh, with the transparent uh, information on our environmental food planning initiatives, uh, having those uh, on the products, related to the products, people can make the right decision. And if, if we have this, I think uh, the, the consumers, uh, and if we educate them, uh, that, will, that will really make a difference. And guess what? Uh, they, they don't um, stop at carbon. This is just really needed to avoid the shift of burdens. Um, and, um, Maybe as some of you uh, know those little men, and I, I talked about it before that we shift the burdens. Um, this this little cartoon. Uh, um, people who are working in a life cycle community are aware of this. I think it's the oldest uh, member of the family of this life cycle related circular economy uh, community. Um, this is what we have been talking about for years. Uh, it is. It's uh, LCA and circular economy together, um, and the circular approach is needed to solve the climate change, uh, as well as uh, to avoid shift the burdens to other environmental impacts. It has been proven that it's possible to look into challenges holistically. Uh, as the, uh, and circular has stand up more than ever to ensure human beings is not ending up like the little man. Um, so this is something which I which I feel is important um, that uh, from all those uh, life cycle approaches uh, that we don't lose sight that we are not creating a new challenge by solving one challenge. So let's finish with a short outlook to 2050. Um, I think there are uh, lots of signs that individual cars will be less important. Um, uh, so that we're going to have like passenger cars, uh, that we share cars, uh, air travel, um, maybe the only mobility on liquid fuels. Um, but these are, this is a little bit abstract, but what all of us, uh, this like people will be forced, I think, to move away from water and forest due to all the risk of fires and floods. Um, and, uh, or alternatively experience floods like in this, um, picture. So. These are all really important things that we're gonna um, really take it serious, the company climate change. Um, and then there is something which is um, science is already seeing first signs of uh, that the Gulf Stream um, collapses. Uh, so this is something which if that happens, if we, if hopefully we are not uh, beyond that yet, uh, then you know what happens. Uh, we might get uh, all this means. We might get the next ice age. So this is something. Uh, there are a lot of reasons uh, why to why to work together from a life cycle circular approach, um, uh, fighting the uh, carbon, uh, the, the climate change. And um, and let me let me that the. Last slide, I'm coming to my end. Uh, do we really want to be dinosaurs to zero? Uh, if we do not act quickly enough, we could become the next dinosaurs. The Earth itself will be fine. I'm pretty sure about it. Uh, in several thousand millennia, but new creatures uh, could inhabit the planet by then. Maybe the dinosaurs will get a second chance. I'm sure they're going to take it. We must uh, decide um, what our future uh, will look like. Either what happened to the dinosaurs, uh, or they did not have the chance to make a cha change. We have the power uh, and the change to change the world through science, technology, through consumer behavior. We can do more than imagine it happening. We can actually make it happen. 
we can do something about it. They could not. So I ask uh, everybody um, and uh, the whole community, do we really want to be the next dinosaurs to zero? And uh, having done that, look deep in our eyes. Uh, we know we still can make it, but we must stop talking and start acting now. And that's why I'm also so happy that we all got together sharing uh, best practices, sharing what we can do. Um, and, uh, and I'm confident that if all around the world and uh, we work together, we can win this fight. So uh, we need to go beyond net zero. Uh, I'm convinced about it. The sooner the better, but we should not and we must not uh, lose sight of all the other environmental impacts. And that's why it's so important to look at it from a circular and life cycle related perspective. Um, thanks a lot for uh, having me. I know that was a little bit different uh, and not an actual circular economy example, but uh, I feel it's really important to share this. Uh, and, uh, and if you have any questions, um, just come back to us. Um, and um, we also, I think the presentation will be shared and there is a link on it on a, on a case study, business case for circular economy on the road to net zero. It's a movie which you also can watch. And I'm more than happy to share that. Thanks a lot for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you here. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Go beyond net zero and act now. Uh, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Thanks to all the three speakers. Uh, we are a little short of time, but nevertheless, uh, I've been told by the organizer that we can go for another uh, five minutes of questions. We have uh, uh, several questions have come in, but some of the uh, uh, important ones, I have put them together. And one question to you, Rene, uh, you spoke extensively about uh, uh, the, the business models, the potential and the opportunities. Uh, the question is, is there a need for a regulation? Would a circular industrial economy guideline, circular industrial economy policy, which over a period of time becomes an act? Do you think that's a possibility or do you think uh, such an uh, uh, such an act, uh, action would uh, help India? Over to you, Rene. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a tricky question as, as usual, but I think that uh, uh, we, we need a certain amount of regulation to create a market and a business case. So we, we need to, uh, as I often say, we need to close the back door uh, because the back door in the sense of where we can just uh, put the waste out and for free. And if this is all, if this remains available as the cheapest option and this can be done without any uh, any restrictions, then there will never be a competitive case. And if you see in Germany, if you see Japan, it's all because the cost of uh, getting rid, rid of waste have become higher. There has been innovation created. So I think that a degree of uh, legislation is necessary. And I also think that uh, uh, I mentioned the, the triple planetary crisis. We have had environmental rules and regulations since the 70s, but the, our current system of environmental governance has somehow not prevented us from getting in the misery that we are right now. So we, we probably need a different set of environmental governments and also responsibility. I think that's also highlighted by this uh, the transition, the transformative change. We'll have to have also a way on how we do the environmental governance and, and related issues and taking also this, this seriously. We cannot go uh, continue on the on the base of having environmental policy and then uh, uh, making compliance uh, conditional on giving a, a handout to enterprises, for example. So 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 we, we need to take this all uh, serious and whether that means that we need a new circular economy legislation or whether we just need to have uh, our our base system of environmental rules and regulations uh, enacted and we really have the polluter pays principle as as a not as a just a paper uh, token but as a as a line that draws it's uh, it's 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 sound so that that, that there is a real uh, uh, buy to it that that encourages also i i think there's there's limits to what the the, the well intended and the innovators can do and we need to bring the rest in and we need to bring the rest in and so for part that will mean that uh, there will be some unpopular uh, uh, measures there will be some some company failures which will create an opportunity for the, the the leaders to grow so we have to make a choice if we continuously want to protect the quote unquote weak ones then we will never get where we need to get and we will also not encourage the stronger ones 
Yeah, and, and let me let me just one comment, uh, if I'm if I may. Uh, I think what you Randy, what you said, that's really great, and I think that sets the baseline and that sets the sets the uh, right for operations. But um, as I also pointed out, I think it's really important to take the consumer. The consumer at the end makes the choice, and if we we need to educate the consumer, we need to be transparent. Uh, we need to we need to really uh, share what we do with the consumer, uh, and uh, I think a lot of times uh, we and I am also a consumer. We we push back the uh, say, okay, governments, you need to have a regulation. Uh, hey, you need to do this. You need to do that. Uh, and this is putting uh, pushing back the responsibility we all have to save our planet and to make it a better world. So I think. It's really the, the working together of governments, industry, uh, academia, and the consumer to make that happen. And uh, we all have to, to to agree and push in the same direction because otherwise we have so many regulations and there are so many ways to go beyond the regulations and doing something. You see that everywhere. Uh, and this is why I'm, I'm, I don't get tired to uh, really push towards, we all sit in this boat together. We need to make sure we get out of this together and um, industry and uh, governments are setting the, the baseline for communication uh, to the consumer and the consumer makes the choice. Thank you. Rashi, would you like to add anything to this? Or I have another two, three questions for you. Yeah, no, um, I think I agree with what Rene said in terms of um, if we already make it, uh, uh, you know, give out all the subsidies, then uh, this, uh, you know, we don't get to see what what uh, strong solutions survive, and I think we're an example of that. I think we grew up in an industry where no regulations were going our way, and I think that made us today a stronger, a better business model and a stronger and a better company. Brilliant. Uh, I, I, the questions to you, Rashi. Is, uh, you spoke about plastic recycling. Is endless recycling of plastic possible? Yes. Number one. Number two. Uh, is there a uh, way to do green packaging models? Some rating for packaging, mandate uh, recycle content in plastic packaging. Yes. Mandating uh, recycle plastics only for packaging. These are some of the uh, questions which have been raised by the delegates. So uh, plastics, uh, if we recycle it, if we recycle it correctly, we can, yes, recycle the same plastic uh, again and again, right? So uh, the the Surf Excel bottles that I'm, I, uh, you know, showed you, we're already getting a lot of those ba bottles back in our uh, recycling unit to recycle them again, right? And, uh, and I think uh, that is a testament that, and we're able to recycle them again and again as well. So I think that is a testament that, yes, it can be recycled. But the model is uh, currently uh, the way it works is we replenish some of the uh, recycled plastics with uh, a mix of uh, uh, you know virgin plastics, and uh, that way it can be uh, made to be recycled uh, again and again. And uh, in terms of regulations uh, in India, we we are already seeing uh, you know some regulations uh, at least at the state level around the use of uh, you know 20 percent or 30 percent recycled content in packaging um, and i think maharashtra state for example has already passed a regulation that requires uh, major brands to include um, you know recycled content in their packaging um, but i think uh, like with everything we need to um, we you know we can't put the horse before the cart i think uh, uh, you know, until we have an industry that can support the entire demand of all of these, uh, you know, packaging people, we can't make it a very strict regulation. Uh, but I think as more companies like us grow up in the ecosystem, it'll make sense to have those, uh, you know, strict regulations around packaging as well. Thank you. Thank you. Another uh, interesting question to you, uh, uh, Mark. You spoke about nutrition label. label. It took a lot of time for nutrition label to make an impact on consumer behavior. Similarly, the environmental footprint, if put on all packages or materials, how long will it take to make an impact to change impact on consumer behavior? Um, I think that that really depends on us uh, as a consumer. If we 
uh, if we feel this is really, and I, I think it will be faster than the nutrition label because the nutrition label came in when people have not been uh, really looking at uh, at carbohydrates and foods, and that came over time. Uh, but now we are all aware of all those environmental impacts which we have. And I think if we have this established and we have a system where it's transparent and looking uh, and putting that, I think within a few years that will have an impact because we will make a buying decision because we see, uh, we see, you see the floodings, you see the fires, you see it everywhere. It's like, I would be surprised it would take more than two years to make an impact. Oh, two years. Uh, very optimistic. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I think we are uh, almost run out of time. It's uh, 4 9 and the next session starts at 4 15. Uh, thank you, Renee. Thank you, Rashi. Thank you, Mark, uh, uh, for the excellent presentations. And uh, all of us uh, enjoyed it really well. And I'm sure uh, uh, the delegates also would have uh, uh, been substantially benefited by listening to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Yes. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, uh, we would request all the delegates to immediately join our next session, session number six, master sec uh, speaker session. Is India ESG ready? So this will be presented by Dr. Mukund Govind Rajan, chairman of EQ Investment Advisors Private Limited. So this will be starting at 16:15. We would request all the participants to kindly join the next session. Thank you. Thank you.